Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our, our next guest is incredible. She's just incredible. She's uh, been nominated for Pulitzer, Tony's, One Drama Desk Awards, and MacArthur Fellowship. She's a published author. She was in The West Wing and Nurse Jackie. And uh, in 2013, she received the National Humanities Medal from our last real president, Barack Obama. In her one-woman shows, Anna Devere Smith plays a vast amount of diverse characters based on interviews that have been conducted on the subjects. It's a style of theater she began in the early 90s and has continued today. Her performances are always breathtaking, and uh, it's the heart of these interviews and the individual humanity that she captures so beautifully in these shows that, that make them so special. Her new work is on HBO, and it's called Notes from the Field. Let's take a look. What is the number one civil rights issue of the day? It is impossible to talk about the criminal justice system without talking about education. Prison don't do nothing but make you a worse or worse person. You want to change, you got to do it by yourself. Even if I didn't make it down the pole, the statement would still be made. It's a movement and it's not going to stop. Most teenagers get incarcerated all because of your mouth. It's prison or death. Never lose faith. Keep the faith. <laughs> We're going to keep demanding justice. A message to black America. Don't expect nobody to open the door for you. Can't wait for the leaders to make it better. We have to make it better. Everybody, please welcome the incredible Anna Devere Smith. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, congratulations on this, this latest project. Uh, as I said before, it's, it's unbelievable. It's beautiful. It's heartbreaking. It's breathtaking. And your performances are out of this world. Um, I want to I wanna go back to the, the beginning a little bit before we dive into this one specifically. When did this start for you? When did you realize that this was a form of theater that felt natural to you, that felt like it was what you should do? In the early 1980s. How did that happen? What, what, what were you doing and, you know? Well, I mean, I, I had started thinking about, uh, oh, I can't think of a better, it sounds like a lot of words, can't think of a better way to say it, but, um, well, let me put it this way. I started thinking about how the words we use are who we are, and obviously language is given to us, uh, we have to speak it, sometimes it's conquered, you know, whole continents and stuff like that, right? But you're given a certain language, and some people are, have command of more than one, and then it's up to you how those words come out of your mouth. So I don't think about language as something that goes right across the page. That's only because of we have to learn to read. But there's actually a musicality to how all of us speak. And at a certain given point in any given hour, I know that a person will begin to speak in a way that's as unique as their fingerprint. That's a lot of words to say, that's what I've been studying even before the 80s, as long ago as the mid 70s. And so, uh, you know, I, in, I actually started out as a language major, abandoned that, but uh, I guess I be believe that you're speaking a foreign language and I'm speaking a foreign language and I wanna know what you do with the English language once you're given it. So I think of anybody talking as a kind of jazz musician, of the language they have in front of them. And, and, and then I realized that we also absorb the world around us, not just here, but here and everywhere else, and how we have absorbed it is revealed in how we speak. So then I was able to go, and I've made about 18 plays this way, I was able to go to places where things had happened and ask people who, uh, to bear witness and what I come out of it all with is a kind of a tapestry of a portrait of any given moment or event uh, from the point of view of many different people speaking in their own individual kinds of English. And how do you then construct this, the, the, this event? So like with notes from a field, uh, notes from the field, excuse me, I would say that you are 
it's not like you're attacking one side of the issue and just holding there and having many interviews. You're, I mean, at one point we have a Native American who's on the, you know, from the reservation, but he's been incarcerated at one point. So what is his cycle like? We have teachers, we have people with different, teachers with different points of view about how to handle violence within the school system or the way that the school system is going. How do you end up constructing all these interviews and encapsulating them into one show? Right, so quite simply for, 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 for notes from the field, I interviewed 200 and 50 people in four different geographic areas. Well, actually, that's not a lot. I mean, my play House Arrest, which, House, House Arrest, which is about politics, I, I interviewed 520 people and interviewed and, and, uh, and, 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 and performed over 40 for Twilight, which was about the Los Angeles riots. I interviewed over 300 people and played 43 people when it was on Broadway. So um, for this, it's actually kind of a small population of 250 people, 300 er uh, hours or more of material. And then the job is, how do I widow that down into 89 minutes and how do I uh, put it into some type of order or composite that makes some kind of sense. Yeah. And there's no one story here. So, um, you know, if you think of it more like a symphony, you know, I'm trying to get somewhere, you know, by accruing sort of ideas that you as an audience are putting together. When did you go to college? Uh, 2002 to 2006. Okay, so, you know, thank God for you, um, for me being in my audience, because already, I mean, you went to a college... Uh, to college at a time that at least we understood that no one person holds the story of America. Mm -hmm. When I went to college, it was white males told the story of America and the world. But, you know, you went to college at a time that you could accept the fact that there were many voices, you know, the, 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 the discourse was much wider. So you're actually more prepared to understand what I'm doing than people who are my age, to tell you the truth. You're ready for a broken story. You understand no, there's no one author. Yeah, sorry, you lost me there for a second. That was such a... <laughs> talking about my college days. Um, what is your workshop process like, though, to figure out, that to whittle it down? If you don't mind me asking. I know that sometimes the magician doesn't want to reveal their secrets. Well, I mean, you know, uh, really it starts when I'm talking to somebody that uh, they'll start, you know, talking in a way that's that type of musical way I'm talking about. And then I'll go, oh, my God, you know, I've, I've got to put that in the show. And then I start to think about, well, where could it go, given everybody I've talked to so far? Uh, and, 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 and then I get to the point, you know, after, you know, I'm still in the field when that happens. And then when I finally get to the rehearsal hall, I just start testing that out of uh, different moments and then to see if it's going to make sense. And then when it really gets serious... Uh, like, you know, you usually in the theater have four weeks of her rehearsal. Let's say it's week number two, and the play is still four hours long. Uh, <laughs> then, um, you know, I like to pe put people in the room who are going to disagree. I'm not conflict-averse, but I don't enjoy argument. Uh, but a lot of people do. So um, I go in rehearsal. I play the play that I have that day. Uh, I listen to the people argue. Uh, I just sit there, and then I go home and I write a different play. And I come back the next day, and I play that new play, and then they fight, and then I go home. And then, you know, there we are, you know, two days before the show opens, and it's still, you know, a half hour too long. And by then, we're sitting in the dressing room. By then, usually the producer or the artistic director has come downstairs, somebody we've <laughs> never really see. They've come downstairs and, you know, say polite things like, well, you have an embarrassment of riches, but... And then... <laughs> And then we're there till 3 o'clock in the morning trying to, like, you know, crying to sort of kill off certain people, characters that we love, and leave them on the cutting room floor. But if you start with 250 or f over 500, does that make it easier when you get down to that you're over a half an hour and you have to cut a couple of characters because you've already cut no, so many? No, that makes it harder. I mean, you know, it makes it harder. But, hey, you know, it's like a great big piece of fabric and you're only making one dress. Where did, where did Notes from the Field start? What was the, who did you want to start interviewing? Where did the idea come from for this piece? Really, uh, you know, from a philanthropist. And, uh, you know, we think of philanthropists as people write checks that, that we need in order to do our work. But the, one of the, it's great that philanthropists have money, um, but the other thing that many of them have is a, a lot of information. You know, because they want to solve problems. If they, if if they if they if they're interested in getting rid of malaria, 
they know they got a, they got a brain trust of a lot of people, a think tank of people who know a lot about malaria. And so such a person knew a lot about uh, discipline in schools. And she said to me, what do you know about the school to prison pipeline? I actually went to get money for something else and, and never got that money. And I said, <laughs> uh, I said, nothing. And she said, well, I want you to come over to the foundation. I want you to learn about it. And she brought 15 people from around America and, uh, and they all told me these awful stories. I was there almost all day of things that were happening to kids in public schools, getting pushed out of school, stories about, you know, kids in kindergarten being put in handcuffs for having, um, for having uh, temper tantrums. Uh, one, one story that really, for me, was the turning point was a story about a kid in Baltimore where I grew up um, who, who urinated in a water cooler. And the, he was gonna, they were going to take him to jail. And I just, you know, now I go, oh, yeah. Well, that's funny. You know, oh, well, exactly. Come on, that's funny. Come on, he's a kid. Come that's on, great. that's funny. And I don't know if any of your viewers have ever saw a show, a show called Nurse Jackie. I was on, on it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so there was this great, wonderful, elegant British actress. And I told her about it. And she said a version of what you said, you know, in this sort of Oxford educated voice, you know, well, whatever happened to mischief? Yeah. And it was just like, oh my goodness. Well, rich kids get mischief and poor kids get pathologized and incarcerated. And I was like, I'm ready, I'll sign up. Yeah. And so really a, a group of foundations doing this work felt that I could use the theater to expose the problem. And I think that was really uh, imaginative of them, you know, cause they could just give all their money to people who are you know, writing papers, you know, or, or, or giving speeches or teaching classes. And they were willing to trust an actor to learn the story and tell the story. So I'm very grateful for that. And it's been a transformative experience. Oftentimes when people talk about the school to prison pipeline, what they, they also start talking about private prisons and the idea that we are pushing people into the prison system off of some sort of capital, capitalist model. But I'm wondering if that's something that you saw, or if it's even as clear as that, or if there is a kind of cultural culture around policing that has gotten somewhat poisoned. Yeah, well, I mean, so um, I think that Sherilyn Eiffel, who was the uh, the um, the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, is the first speaker in the movie. And wonderful too. Can I just comment with this? The way that you present her as sort of involved, but also kind of like. Semi, she's talked about this a hundred times. She knows about it. Why doesn't the rest of the world know about it? Sort of tone. It's just, it's so articulate and perfect the way that you did that. Well, she's articulate and perfect, not me. Um, uh, Your presentation of her. Well, see, <laughs> mimicking her, me mimicking her. Um, you know, really, she spells it out for us that we can't possibly talk about criminal justice and mass incarceration without talking about education, that the two things are linked to one another. And why they're linked to one another is because this is a country that makes investments. And when, it's kind of mind blowing, you know? She says, you know, we, we created an interstate highway system. Imagine an America without an interstate highway system. Well, there was a time. You know, so somebody wakes up and goes, we need an interstate highway system. And then, you know, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of money later, we have an interstate highway system. That's what we have the potential to do. Well, we need a public school system. And we and need they a wake public school. And they made a public school system. But then they just slowly sucked money away from it over the course of decades. Well, by the way, well, I'm going to give you some homework. The plan for a public school system was first written out by Thomas Jefferson in notes uh on the state of Virginia. I just realized maybe I'm mimicking that title with the first word here, notes from the field. Ew. I thought and you were gonna say notes from the field that no, I was, was I notes, supposed to get that? Notes, no, no, I didn't. <laughs> notes of the state of Virginia. Anyway, so uh, it's really in there that he lays out this plan of what education is gonna be. Of course, it's only gonna be white boys. But having said that, um, he thought that this system should find the excellent ones and throw out, I quote, the rubbish. That was Thomas Jefferson. We are still like that. Schools are sorting mechanisms, right? And right now they tend to be very focused on who's gonna to go to college and spend $90,000 a year, which is what my students spend to go to NYU, uh, to be artists. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, it's, <laughs> you know it, it's kind of out of control right now. Do you ever want to get in front of your students and just go, just go be artists, it's okay? No, they, that's what they are. I mean, I teach artists, that's who I teach. You know, I teach people, graduate students who, you know, very talented people who want to be doing what you're doing or something one day. Uh, yeah, no, 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 it's very real. So um, I, I, I focus on children who can't make it, uh, very aware that there's a big movement that's against mass incarceration, against privatization of prisons. But my, my focus is on the things that keep kids from being able to stay in school, that keep them from having enough self-regulation to make it as far as the sixth grade. And, you know, I was in and out of juvenile halls and prisons and streets and stuff like that. How many kids did you did you interview for it? That's a great question. I'm gonna go count. I don't know, but, you know. A lot. A lot, yeah. yeah. The story that you tell of the, the young woman who was sitting next to the, the girl that was sort of tossed from her desk is, heartbreaking you know you like you essentially tell the story of a woman who's on, uh, of, a, of a young girl who's on a set who's who's created a good path for herself and is kind of on her way and the system essentially tries to strip it away in in in, in, in one moment what was it what you know what was it like when you found that story were you like oh this is exactly what this this needs to go in here did you know right away well I mean a lot of people saw the video of officer fields uh, who was what is called a school resource officer. We're going to see a lot more of them in schools where they haven't been before, given recent events in Florida. Right, instead of going after guns because they actually, yeah. At any rate, you know, it's like black people are the ones in the canary mind. I mean, you know, so we've, we've already been, we know now, uh, 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 black people and poor, black kids and poor kids, uh, uh, Native American brown kids and poor white kids know what it's like to have those school resource officers around, the cops, Officer Fields, who was also the football coach, came into the room because young Shakara would not put her cell phone away and tried to get the cell phone. She wouldn't give it to him. So then he tried to extract her from the chair very violently. And so we saw him throwing her across the room like a rag doll. The thing that is mind blowing about that video is everybody else is just all the kids and, you know, are looking at their computer. So our heroine, Naya Kenny stands up and starts yelling, you know, is nobody going to do anything about this? She uses a vulgar word. She's taken to prison. Because South Carolina has a law called the Disturbing Schools Law. Nobody's quite sure what that law is for, but it can be pulled out when they want to. So basically... It's also like one of those vague laws? It's that, a very vague yeah. law. It really started, I don't want to take us off the track, to stop flirting. <laughs> Go ask in the 1920s. Go, go, you know, go figure, as they say. Nonetheless, the flirting law was available to take Naya Kenny off to jail for being outraged that Shakara was being thrown across the room. When nobody else, not the teacher, not the vice principal, nobody else was doing anything about this child being handled that way by a great big guy. So, um, but the great news is Naya Kenny, who's just a kid. I mean, um, you say, I mean, I went down there to, to learn about that and, and was able to find her and talk to her. This is a young lady who just wants to have a smoke shop. That's her dream in life. She has no plan to be an activist, but now she is one. And Kimberly Crenshaw is quite an extraordinary legal scholar, uh, brought her to New York. And, um, you know, I think she's on her way to being a leader. Is that something that you're seeing more and more as, as young people? I mean, I think we just saw that this weekend a little bit, as young people uh, themselves are more affected by the kind of backwards policies that make up this country. We are creating more activists rather than passive. Pacifists might be the wrong word, but those who are not. You mean sort passive of observers. Yeah, yeah, passive observers. I, mean, yeah. I hope so. I mean, I think uh, we've uh, seen ever since, uh, you know, Trump's inauguration that, you know, people are taking to the streets and with the tragedies uh, that we have just, the tragedy we have just been watching in Florida, we see young people coming forward and speaking up um, out of that tragedy. Uh, it, I feel kind of odd about all these grown-ups just sitting around and saying, wow, look at these great strong kids when it's things we should have been protecting them from, of course. But one of my colleagues at NYU, former colleagues now at UCLA, Pedro Nogueira, told me when I was 
you know, I looked to him a lot while I was writing notes from the field for, you know, just his brains and smarts and coolness. And, you know, he told me then, he said, you know, activism is not going to happen in colleges the way that it did when, you know, I was in college. Because college students, you know, it costs too much to go to school, you know, don't make that investment and not go to class. We didn't go to class. And the right has done an amazing job of painting colleges as these elite institutions made up of out of touch millionaires and children of millionaires and billionaires. And well, it's like not that. just children of millionaires. It's people who have to pay these high tuitions. They have to hold three jobs to do it, and they know that they're going to have a lot of debt when they leave. For that reason, he felt that high schools are the places that we're more likely to find activism. I don't think he could have imagined that it's this particular reason. But I think there are a lot of things for high school students to be active about, honestly. I know, I'm curious, I'm sure you've been developing uh, notes from the field for a, a couple, how long, a couple of years at least, probably? Uh, since 2011. Since 2011. What has it been like to have this work and be presenting this work in the wake of, well, during the campaign and then the election of and then all of the policies that have come from the Trump administration? Well, let me tell you that the more significant thing, honestly, that happened was I actually wasn't, I've made 18 plays this way, but it's a lot of work and I wasn't really planning to make a play. I was just going to go interview people and then perform in those small communities. So th just so that the community would have a reason to come together and talk. My job was just, you know, and then it's on you. What are you going to do about this? Maybe you didn't know. That was my first goal. And then right after I did that for the first time, uh, in 2014, Michael Brown was killed, and really a movement began. This is when we start to hear more uh, about Black Lives Matter. A lot of people would take talk about that movement, starting with Trayvon Martin. And, um, and then that year, we had this a very disturbing almost film festival of people being beaten or killed by police officers and videotape having captured that. So that's really what happened to make me think, oh, I better, I have content, I'm going to go go on stage, I'm going to make this into one of my kind of plays. And, um, and it was really in that kind of a uh, 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 spirit of the country that I first put this on stage. When I came to New York, was the fall of 2016 and Trump was uh, elected and I could feel a palpable shift in the feeling in the audience when that happened. What was that, what was that shift? It was like walking into a morgue every night. Yeah. Well, it's one of the things that I think I said uh, in, the, in, the, in the green room and I'll try to say it again is that uh, one of the most heartbreaking things of notes from the field is that, you know, we weren't, as a country, we weren't on top of these things while Obama was president, but it did feel like Holder and Obama, in slow <laughs> Democratic Party ways, were moving the needle a little bit in trying to address these issues. Uh, one of them being probably school to prison pipeline, but the, the mass incarceration rates. And it feels like with this new administration, we've just completely, we're just completely neglecting the realities of what we have to address in this country. Well, it was in the Obama administration that the data came out. You know, one of my first stops when I started working on this was the Department of Justice and, uh, and the Department of Education in Washington, at the White, you know, went to the White House. And, and Valerie Jarrett, who I was actually lucky enough to be with last night, and she and Van Jones at the 92nd Street. Why? You know, Valerie invited me to the White House to do a fireside chat with her on school discipline. So this was something that was very, very much, you know, Obama, I spoke with him about it. They were very aware of the school to prison pipeline. As you know, President Obama was the first sitting president to go to a federal prison, first one to go to an Indian reservation. Mm -hmm. So they gave, let's, let's, you know, the fact is the information's there because of what they did. And the problem of inequity in education is as old as what I talked to you about, Thomas Jefferson. Right? Only the excellent ones matter, and certainly if we go back to slavery, black people could be killed for reading a book. So I see this almost like kind of a river, right, of, 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 of think of the people who risked their lives to try to integrate the schools. My friend Charlene Hunter Galt, who integrated the University of Georgia, a black woman, when she arrived, those white girls at the University of Georgia threw rocks in the window. They had a two-day riot. Because a black lady shows up to go to school. That was only like, what, 60, 67 that years ago? That was in ago. the 60s. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's never been right. It's just that right now, what we uh, tend to do is to get diverted 
and distracted. But I, be, I know that the, most of the 250 people I met while I was trekking the school to prison pipeline are people who've always been working on it and are working on it today. They don't get diverted and distracted. They don't get diverted. I met very committed people. They don't get diverted. They know what they're doing. That's hopeful. It's right? real hopeful. Yeah. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Here's a question right here. Hello. Um, I currently go to NYU for film and TV, actually, and I have an interest in public policy. For my um, first essay I did there, I kind of wrote about your play since I've seen it at the Loeb Theater. And I was really wondering then and kind of now as well, um, how did your um, idea of the prison of pipeline shift after going through this whole process first, like what your initial like knowledge of it was to after all of it? Oh, it's such a great question. I thank you for that. Um, well, first of all, I think it's unfair to call it the school to prison pipeline. It makes it look like this is about schools and teachers. The teachers I met work really hard. I could never do what they do. This is about poverty. And this is about violence. And if we want schools to be the intervention that they, I guess, need to be, we have to completely revise what they are. You know, I don't have imagination to say what they would be like. But when you think that, you know, when we, for example, uh, I learned a lot about child trauma doing this. I learned that uh, 17 million children in the United States uh, need mental health help. Only one third of them are being serviced. I learned that there is no public mental health system for children in this country. Um, where's that going to happen? Is it? And in fact, is it only going to be thought about as pathology, or can we look at the growth of a young person in a way that there's a whole lot of different things happen that happen? And how could we, you know, how can we incite joy? So I think that schools aren't equipped to be this intervention that we expect them to be. And, you know, uh, uh, I learned a lot about poverty and what it does to communities, what it does to families, and how hard it is to make your way out of that reality. I mean, you know, some of the young men that I met, guns and violence in the streets and running drugs is a reality of their lives. It's not a television show. Right Or the person who said to me, a lawyer in San Francisco, who said to me, well, my problem is uh, the prostitution, the school to prostitution pipeline. And these are the things that happen to young ladies. So I learned a lot about how much this spills well outside of uh, schools. Next question. Oh, good afternoon. Um, I'm so used to you playing the boss chick, like, in Nurse Jackie. So, like, how do you, when you're in the field, how do you bring out so many different personalities and characters without, you know, just keeping it authentic so you won't mix up the characters, I guess? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Nobody's ever asked me that. Well, you know, it's technical. In a way, it would be like asking a singer, how do you not mix up the songs, you know? Every song is different. And then in the field, my job is just to uh, uh, listen, you know. Um, so I don't, I don't mix it up because everybody's so different. Thank you. Thank you. One more question right here. The, um, when I listen to you, what I wonder is if there's a call to action of some kind that you're eliciting. And I don't think you, I don't think you do. Uh, and Ricky talked about we're developing activists. So in way back, I joined marches in front of Woolworths because that was something that tangible that you could do as a high school student or a college student. And you talk about high school being the new source of activism. What in particular, uh, either in, in uh, gun violence, uh, bail reform, voting rights, what, what's your call of action to them if they say, what can we do to participate? Um, you know, I believe in proximity. So, and one of the things we did when the play was on, when it was a play on stage was stop the show in the middle and then divide audiences of 500 people up into 20, groups of 20 with facilitated conversations to ask exactly that kind of question. And I think that people have potential no matter 
what their resources are to do something. So someone like Agnes Gund, a great, great philanthropist here in the city, sold a painting for $165 million and gave all the money to, to artists, for artists who want to do work to raise the, you know, make us conscious of these issues of social justice. Uh, Lorene Powell Jobs, who is another woman with a lot of resources, um, is creating, has created what she calls super schools all over the United States, because she understands, as I've indicated, that schools can't possibly do, they're on an old model, we have to have a new idea of school. So she's gonna reinvent high school. So is it that level? Or a friend of mine is mentoring a young uh, African-American man uh, in his early 20s who's at Rikers, a uh, white guy. He goes out to Rikers twice a month to see this young man. He said he's the only white person anywhere to be seen on the bus, to be seen in the visiting room. So I believe in proximity. I think that's one place to, to start, right there. And then I believe in your imagination and the imagination of all the people who see notes from the field if they're inspired to go and get closer to that which seems so strange and so far from them, I believe that I don't think I'm unique. And I think they'll come up with some ideas of what to do. And you've listed some of them right there that uh, any citizen can jump on board. Yeah. Uh, and I love your work so much. Thank you for coming by. Thank you. Talking to me about it. Notes from the Field is on uh, HBO, February 24th at uh, 8 p.m. Do watch it. Uh, it's, it's an incredible piece of work. And Edward Smith, everybody. Thank, Let's you. Care. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.